Welcome back to the Divorce Dad Playbook Podcast. This is part two of our interview uh, with Nicole Ananda. We did a whole first part where we talked a lot about dating apps and struggles finding the right person and, and just a lot of fun. If you haven't listened to that yet because of the way things download, you happen to see this one or listen to this one first, go back, listen to part one, and then pick up here where we took sort of a natural break to get into a second part. And with that, we're back. We're back. Hello. We might have switched places on the screen for those of you who are watching on YouTube. And by the way, just so we throw this in there, um, Nicole, can you just pitch a little bit about really what you do and and wh why you are a sex therapist and how people can get in touch with you um, to to get, you know, not everyone can host a podcast and have you come on. So how can people get in touch with you? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so I run a clinical practice. I, I'm not a sex therapist, so I need to put that. I, I'm sorry. There. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a surrogate partners. I'm a certified surrogate partner and a life coach and a shamanic practitioner and a bunch of other things. But um, what I do looks a lot like sex therapy, but I can't call myself a therapist because I'm not a clinician. So, um, but I do run a clinical practice for people with sexual dysfunctions and intimacy issues. And I employ two um, sex therapists and clinical therapists on my team. And we do surrogate partner therapy, which is basically experiential sex therapy. It's helping people work through relationship issues and intimacy issues which are really the heart of it. It's not sex. Everyone comes to me and says, fix my dick, it's broken. And then we fix all of the other things that are causing that problem, which are you know, childhood traumas and uh, negative life experiences and anxiety and all of that. And we help them work through it in an experiential way in a safe container. So the name of my practice is Ananda Integrative Healing Group. And you can find me at anandaintegrativehealing.com. Thank you. Those very well said. And, and it brings me to the next question that I have for you, which is what you just mentioned with the childhood trauma and things like that. It, how, how many, not percentage wise, but just in terms of like people who come to you, how much of what people are working on is based on previous trauma uh, and how much of it is based on being like shuttered? And, and I, I've dealt with this just personal life, like about people who you know, feel closed off and then as they grow older, they're like, oh, this is what I really like. And it takes forever for them to actually sort of come to terms with who they are. And the more people I talk to, the more I realize, like some people, you get to a certain part in a relationship and it's like, oh, by the way, I really want you to stick this up my whatever. And they weren't comfortable until that point saying that and it changes the dynamic. So I guess my question is sort of like, how, how much is it people dealing with past things that they need to get over in order to move forward? And how much is it just people needing to be open in this type of society and be okay with who you are. If you like something that's a little quote unquote weird for lack of a better term, that's okay. And, 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 you know, people I think are so afraid to just be themselves. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's big T trauma and little T trauma, like micro trauma. And so I think what you're asking about is big T trauma, like people who've been severely abused or neglected and things like that. We get a lot of people like that. But almost everyone in the world has experienced, especially in our society, has experienced little t trauma where you are growing up in you know, a family with dysfunctional communication or unhealthy relating. There are very few, I don't know if I've met any people who grew up in a family where everybody was really well adjusted and everyone communicated well and they knew how to relate to each other in a healthy and mature way. That's kind of, I mean, that's starting to become more of a thing now as as people are evolving, I think, and consciousness is raising. But look at how children were raised, like our parents' generation, right? Like, I'm just gonna hit you and treat you like an object and you better be what I want you to be. And even our parents, I mean, my parents are so kind and loving and wonderful. And they traumatized me tremendously because they just couldn't accept who I was, I was like different and weird. And also no. I needed a reason why I didn't just follow, I didn't do, do what they said. I needed a logical reason why I should do it. And then I would do it. And that, they didn't have time for that, right? So, you know, I got a lot of kind of shaming and, and things that they didn't even realize they were doing because that's just how people parent. Right. And then that's how we grow up closed, closed down, like you're talking about. So I think most people have grown up in some sort of traumatic situation where they weren't able to be their fully expressed authentic self and met with love and acceptance and encouragement. 
And so they end up with all kinds of maladaptive behaviors and ways of seeing the world that they need to then work through so, as they go through. So how do you get how do you how do you get someone in and and work on that over the course of, you know, a couple of sessions, a couple of years, even however long a person is a client? when there's 40 years of that packed in together. It was really hard to get. So how, how much of it is like really getting into what someone has gone through their entire life and just to come to terms with that? Because it feels to me, like you said, it's not about your dick being broken. It's about all the things that are broken that leads to you. Sometimes you don't know the difference. And then that just, now you're just, every time that you're in a situation like that, where you're like, shit, this didn't work. Oh crap, it's not working again. It's just adding to more and more trauma. It's adding to more anxiety about it. Exactly. Yeah, and then people get stuck in their heads about it, and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. And the way we do it, I mean, the reason why I think that the program that we do works so well is because it is truly holistic. A lot of people say that they have holistic programs, and it's kind of the same old stuff. Well, they have a massage therapist, and they have this and that. But we really do approach people from a full 360-degree mind, body, emotions, and soul and I think that piece, the spirit and soul is something that is, that scientists shy away from, therapists shy away from. It's not some, it is, it's part of who we all are. And most people in the world, what, no matter what their religious or spiritual background is, believe that there's something more than just this physical material body, but it's not addressed. Where is it addressed? Where is spiritual life? Not in church, you know, church is kind of bullshit. I mean, I got baptized Catholic in India, right? I love Jesus. I believe in all of that, but um, I don't think church is where to find it, you know? Wait, you believe so, in Jesus? That's so surprising uh, to me. Well, like Jesus, whole... I was actually super anti-Christian growing up, like really, because I think the religion, the organized religion and the way it's been perpetuated on people is terrible. Yeah, that tracks. Okay, that um, makes more sense. And Jesus started showing up for me in kind of my spiritual journey. And I was like, what the hell? And then I just realized how much I resonate with Jesus energy, right? I mean, Christ energy is amazing. If you look at the words of Jesus and what he, he taught people, it's love everyone and we're all one and, you know, love the prostitutes and the lepers. And that's not what Christians today are doing, but not all of them. I don't want to cast aspersions, but a lot not of openly, Christians, but anyway. right, are homophobic and anti-Semitic and racist and all of that. And that is not... Christian values. So we bring in, we help connect people with the deepest parts of themselves that no one else is really even addressing. And I feel like that's why our programs work well. And we don't do it from any kind of religious perspective. Um, mm -hmm. It's just more about just really being in touch and connected with yourself and then with another human being. And once you can do that, you can translate that and generalize it outside of the work that we do and learn how to do it anywhere with anyone. And if everything that she's just said is true, which I clearly believe her, you clearly either believe in Jesus or you need to find Jesus, dude. <laughs> Wait, what? First of all, what does that even yeah, mean? Yeah, all the stuff Jesus. that she just, all the stuff that she just said is a lot of the stuff that, that you go through. I really think that that is... You can believe in oneness. You can believe in there being like a, a higher reason for doing certain things and not believe in, in like a guy who was a carpenter. Like, I mean, that he's I don't like think she back. was saying it's a guy. I don't think she was saying it's a guy who's a carpenter. Who's like, she's like she yeah. found she no. a carpenter is like, Oh, Hey Jesus, how's it going? Like help me. That would be amazing. Career. That'll be an amazing dating profile. Looking for a carpenter. <laughs> Oh God, no, I just divorced a carpenter. And anytime I ever <laughs> see that anyone does construction, I'm like, swipe left, <laughs> no way. No, but it's that, it's that energy, right? It, Jesus was a prophet. I don't think he was God, just like you're God and I'm God and we're all God, right? Jesus was a prophet like Buddha and Muhammad and, and Gandhi and Mother Teresa and all the people who are embodying that higher consciousness on this earth. And there are a lot of yogis who do this. I mean, I don't know if he was raised from the dead, but I know that there are yogis in India who can stop their bodily processes and their, you know, stop their heartbeat and stop their breathing for long periods of time. I mean, supernatural things are possible and I have experienced some of them. So I'm not saying Jesus is the guy and you should worship him like a God, like, you know, Christianity right, right. is saying, <laughs> but I'm saying that he is, he embodied that unity consciousness and we should all learn something from that 
it's funny and and I, we don't need to go off on this tangent and, and but it is interesting that what you take away from the concept of religion and the concept of spirituality is kind of the good part of it and yet to me from the outside organized religion just like harps down on the bad side of it like all the punitive parts of religion if you don't do this and you're just kind of like no like we're all one we're all connected let's just care about each other and everyone else is like but if you don't care about each other guess where you're gonna end up here's a whole mm -hmm. book that tells you and it's just amazing how 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 perverted things have become over the last you know four hundred thousand years yes power corrupts and a lot of what religion is about is power now and money and control same with politics any place where there's that potential for power and control you're gonna have corruption that's why I don't follow any religion. I mean, I like to, sometimes I go to, I, you know, I like Russian Orthodox church. I find that the best. I like going to church where they're not speaking English. You know, I've been to the Vatican and, got, and heard the Latin mass. And that to me speaks more because I don't have to hear whatever bullshit they're saying because some of it's bullshit, right? And I can okay. feel the energy of all the people who've been there in this kind of reverent and worshipful space communing with something larger than themselves which in my opinion is not some guy floating around in the sky, right? It's, it's yeah. just that connection to all of us. Uh, so, so this is gonna be a weird diversion, but I got to ask this question and Danny, you know what I'm about to ask. And, and, I, and I really appreciate Nicole, the, like what you do and, and, and how you do it and how you're helping people in the 360 approach. But when you were on the first time, I had this question, Dan couldn't answer oh, it. Oh, now I, I know. I, it. Sorry, uh -oh. I have to ask. So as a part as a part of the process, because I'm very intrigued, as a mm -hmm. part of the process that you take people through, I know you have other people within your practice. Mm -hmm. Are you actually witnessing intimacy between a patient and somebody else who's on your staff and working with them through that process? Like, is this actually a part of your journey that you take people down? That you're like, there's three of you in a room and they're engaging yeah. in activity like i really need to know this because when dan explained it you scott was a tour asked, of your facility i think is what he's looking for like <laughs> well, is it the like one-way glass but... or two-way glass like where, which way do you stand on <laughs> that's actually how masters and johnson did it they right did that's what i'm saying yeah no, yeah um no so we and we do i'm glad you asked that because a lot of people wonder that and the way that it works is there we we work in a triad and it's 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 in the triadic model is what it's called, where the triad is the client, the clinical therapist, and the surrogate partner. So they come into the practice and do an intake with the clinical therapist and you know, just sitting down in a therapy room or now over Zoom, well, over our HIPAA compliant platform, but um, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to say that we're HIPAA compliant. Right. Um, and they do the clinical intake and look at all the underlying issues and the, you know, whatever might be causing them to have the issues they have. And then they alternate sessions with their surrogate partner who stands in as a real partner and helps create a real connection and relationship within a therapeutic container. And that's me, I'm actually the one doing that. So we do a lot of mindfulness and embodiment and touch exercises. And for a small percentage, they actually do go to sexual contact. So that also provides another, um, to loop it back to the dating, that is another, <laughs> kind of obstacle for me in dating because doing this work, there aren't a lot of men who can handle the fact that I sometimes have sexual contact as part of my work. And they don't seem to get that it's work and it's not fun for me. And it's usually not like some kind of great mind blowing experience, right? right. But it's, I'm shepherding, so it's like a nurse, right? I mean, I, I, I approach it that way, that I'm helping someone and I'm helping them through an experience so they can have that and then feel confidence and competence. But that also can be challenging in finding a man who can handle that. Yeah. Well, I, so, so that's really interesting. I, I, I agree. I'm sure that that really is challenging. Like I know every situation that you go, when you date that, that you start and you start to get to know people, you know, at what point do you start to have that conversation with somebody? Like, I know it's hard to say, like, you don't like Dan, Dan, famously or infamously says like he's a great first date an okay second date and a horrible third date so is that could that be the case like like because the wheels like, fall like, off like, yeah. like a, i think that's what you say right that's exactly what you say so <laughs> at, at what point as and, and maybe it depends upon the person that you're connecting with that they 
dig deeper, which again is part of what I do. And I'm super comfortable. Like what people do, I'm fascinated with their backgrounds are the backgrounds before they met me. They didn't know me. So it has nothing to do with me. Like I'm part of the present and the future. I'm not part of the past. We can deal with the past. So in terms of what you do for a living, which probably would make a lot of men who are not confident, a little bit shaky uh, mm -hmm. with you, wh when does that come out? Like, does it come out almost immediately or do, or do you kind of get to know them a little bit and say, oh, by the way, this is what I do. And, and I hope that you're comfortable with it or you better be comfortable with it or you need to be comfortable with it or how does that play out? <laughs> um, I mean, it comes up whenever it comes up. I put my, uh, my place of work and what I do. I mean, I'm the founder and the managing partner. So that is my title. And that's what I put as my title in any of the apps that allow you to put that. But if anybody actually wanted to do any research, um, they could find out easily. If they ask me what I do, I tell them, sadly, it doesn't seem like many men are really that interested in getting to know a woman because I don't get, you know, like I said, that that interview process would be wonderful. I would love for someone to actually ask me questions and want to know who I am and whether I'm a good match for them. It doesn't happen that often. I feel like, I don't know, there are a lot of flaky, just not serious time wasters out there. Yeah. And um, so they don't ask it. If they ask, I'll tell them right off the bat. And obviously it would come up, I think, in a first date because you, you're going to have that conversation about kind of what you do for a living and what your life is about. Yeah. And I mean, I never say, I don't have any kind of like, you better accept it. Or I hope you, it's definitely not, I hope you accept it. Cause like, fuck you if you don't. Right. <laughs> right. Um, well, it's more like, please accept me. What, yeah. Yeah. No, it's like, here, here I am either like it or you don't. And if right. you don't, right. you know, God bless you and see you later. Right. See, right. it's funny. It's funny you say it that way because, and this is, probably why we matched when we did at the point in my life where I was, because you said at the beginning of this, you want somebody who's a strong man, you know, somebody who can really keep up with you. But to Scott's question, if you are insecure, I would think someone who knows how to handle those insecurities delicately, who can respect that, who is not going to make you feel shame for having some of these issues and is going to be understanding would be the perfect person to be with. So it's funny to me, like somebody who's anxious and intimidated by that should come across what you do and think, wow, this woman is not only amazing, she might be able to help me through our, you know, just become a more well-rounded person. And it's funny that you say like people who find out like they go the opposite way and they're like, well, they can't handle it. What is wrong with people? I, well, I've done that enough times to know that that doesn't work. Like Scott was saying where, you know, it's, it, I can help this person and it's easy. It, that never works. If they can't meet you where you are, then you're better off being their friend. I'm happy to be friends with somebody who needs that level of love and support and acceptance because for me, kind of being unconditional love and helping other people feel good about themselves is my life purpose. So be, being your friend and doing that, 100%, I'd be happy to do that. But as my partner, I want somebody who's going to lift me up and um, I just meant from me. the guy. I just meant from the guy's yeah. perspective. Like, well, if somebody but, hears but, that from you, that, and like they run away, like, whoa. But, but that, but Dan, you're speaking from your guy's perspective because to Nicole's That's point, the way that I feel about it is, when, when, and this is true. This is reality. Anyone that I've dated, like, they've asked these questions, like, what are you looking for? You know, like, who do you want to be with? Like, all the usual questions. And by the way, there's a lot of flaky women out there too. It's not just flaky guys. Yeah. Uh, so, so when they ask that, I mean, part of what I say is. And I don't know how to I don't know how to explain this any differently when you're first getting to know somebody. I'm like, I want somebody who's got my back. I want somebody who's got my back as much as I have yours. Because I do have your like if you're my partner, I have your back. Like I believe in you, I pump you up. Like that's who I am. And that's who my that's what my personality is all about. And and when I say that to people, they're like, oh my God, that's like amazing. But I don't know that I do that. I don't know how to do that. Or or maybe I haven't ever had that before. And that brings the old baggage forward. And again, that's when you start getting into, you know, digging through a lot of baggage, which does interfere with the ability to have a new relationship with somebody who is genuine and is there to have your back. So I don't think, Dan, what you're saying is so accurate because I, I don't fall into that bucket of like what all guys think. I think I'm not presenting myself as so unique, but I do think that I'm unique because 
not because of what we're talking about now, but because of the dates that I've been on and the, and the interactions I, and, and reactions I've gotten from statements like that. I just meant, the only thing that I meant was the, the actual physical work, Nicole, that you do and how that could be intimidating somewhere where it's like, oh, you do sex for a little, you know, and like, they're like, oh, I don't want to, that, that's when you talked about that specifically, that's where I was going with that. Like if I, if I heard that and I heard what you do actually listen to you, which, you know, and I'd be like, wow, this, this is exactly what I, you know, if you're insecure about that kind of stuff. So that happens to you. I mean, how, how, when you do bring it up, it does come up on a first date. Like, do, do, are you, are you predisposed to like, look at a guy's eyes when he says like, so what do you do for a living? And you're like, all right, here it comes, here comes the hammer. Like, does that happen to you or? Um, oh, I unmuted you. Sorry, go ahead. You didn't bad. want me to answer that question. <laughs> no, I don't know what happened. I was trying to switch to you and it's somehow muted you. My bad. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, um, I mean, that really that hasn't happened. And it's hard to say if it's because I I I'm aware that I'm kind of a compelling person, right? You know, I'm like I'm attractive and I'm intelligent, I'm good at conversation, I have like a good energy. And I'm not saying that to like again be a narcissist, but whenever I date somebody, I don't think, I think they're just like, I'm going to get what I can get out of this. So maybe they don't like it. Or maybe they're like, oh, that means that she's not relationship material, but they're still going to stick around and try to hang out with me and see if they can sleep with me. I mean, they don't ever get to that point because if, you know, that's not what I'm looking for, but right. um, I've never had anybody really just go, oh, well, no, thanks. Then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> And I think it's because like, you know, but because there are a lot of guys out there like you that are like, all right, well, I'm just going to get what I can get. I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to have experiences. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just I mean, know. all right, I don't want to marry this woman, but like, you know, who knows, maybe we'll have some fun together. Right. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want those kind of guys really because, you know, I just, I mean, it's not like I'm not looking to have fun and experiences too. But I have a lot going on. I'm running a business, two businesses. I've, I'm a single mom, right? I don't have time for just fucking around. And I have a lot of friends. Like if I want to just have fun, I have a lot of amazing friends to go have fun with, including guy friends, you know? So mm -hmm. I have a guy to go shooting with and go to the hockey game. And, you know, I want somebody who wants me for like me and to really go deep with me and be my soul partner, S-O-U-L. S-O-U-L. <laughs> yeah. Right. And Dan, see, so this is what we talk about. And you and, and I do and I'm not knocking you, but I do think that how we're at different positions and different places in our lives in this journey of, you know, I've been apart for so long. I agree with what regardless of this whole conversation, I totally agree with what you said, Nicole. That's actually the position that I'm in too. I got plenty of friends and I'm really looking for somebody who who gets me and understands me and is interested in me and 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 views me as an equal. I don't think that I'm better than than others and I don't think that they're better than me. I think that that they're better than me in certain things. I'm better than them in certain things and I think together we can come, you know, and and we could be good in each these unique things and be great together. And 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 sometimes I honestly go through this dating process and as I've had minor successes, more failures, I wonder if what I'm looking for is actually even possible. And, 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 I, and I am super confident and I go into every conversation and every engagement of meeting people with that kind of confidence. But I do feel, and this is where Dan and I really differ because I've been through the phase where he is, where I was doing all the things that Dan was doing, maybe not, maybe not all the things that Dan's doing, but I was doing a lot of what Dan was doing. And, and now at this point, I'm just, I'm just at it. I'm just, come on, bro. Pregnant women and homeless women, I'd say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I didn't need to say it. Thank you. Exactly. Not been my experience. But, but, but to your point, not there's anything wrong with that. But to your point, and I think that this is like that misnomer that just because I'm serious, in some respects, serious to find a soul, maybe S O U L N S O L E, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if I'm looking to find that, doesn't mean I don't want to have fun. Doesn't mean I'm not having fun. Doesn't mean I'm not excited. Doesn't mean all those things. It just means that I'm taking one aspect of it more seriously. See, I'm looking for an SOL, mate. Just fire. Just straight sun. Just like as hot as fire. That's it. <laughs> Soul. SOL. And then I'm SOL afterwards. Yeah, don't fly too close, though. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I'm just, it's SOL, and then I'm just, I'm not sure. So. 
No, I look, I get what you both are saying. I do. But Scott and, and, and Nicole, I, would, I don't know if you hear the same thing as me because you're in a different situation. But Scott, the way I hear it is you say you're not better than someone else. You want this. You want that. You want this. But you want such a very specific type of person. And Nicole, you said this before, like you're looking for another one percenter. You're looking for another person who can keep up with you. So in essence, Scott, I'm not, I'm not, it's not a judgment, but you're saying you're not better than other people, but you are better than other people. You have to admit that because once you admit you're better than other people, not, no, not in a condescending yeah. way, but that you're looking for something better than what is mo- Nicole, you're not no, looking you're for using, the average guy. You're using, the wrong, you're using the wrong word, Dan. Better you're using is not the wrong word. Better is not the right word. I know it's Different. not a judgment. Right I'm just using what you said, that, but that's the term no. you said. No, no, but, no. I, but you took it out of context. Nicole, yes. help me out. Yes. No, 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 no. No one is better than anyone. And I'm not, I'm not better than anyone. And I, you know, if you have any connection with soul and spirit, you have to know that you are better than no one, right? Like Jesus is washing the feet of the beggars. And there's a reason for that because he's better than no one, even though he was amazing. So there you go. Yeah. So you could get he Jesus just... to do your floors while, while you do the dishes. <laughs> oh, oh, Jesus. God. No. <laughs> oh my I... goodness. That was a call back to two episodes ago, but go ahead. Not better, just different. So I don't think I'm better than anybody. And I have something to learn from every single person that ever crosses my path. So, but I do think I'm different from, I'm not, I'm not kind of like, I don't fall in the middle of the bell curve. So I'm different from most people. And I want someone who is different like I am because I can relate to them better. That's more of it. Yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't have said that better myself to Dan. So thank you, Nicole, for speaking <laughs> on behalf of look, both I, of look, us. I, no, I look, I mean, honestly, and, I, and I, I mean this very sincerely, like I care about both of you. I believe in that you believe what you're saying, but I think it's bullshit. I think it's bullshit. I don't think you drop in what your IQ is and drop in the fact that you say you're a 1% type of person and what you're looking for and then say you're not i'm not saying it's I'm, uh, it's not a value judgment of, of the goodness of a person or or the or the deservedness of what they get in life like everyone deserves the same chance everyone deserves the same of everything I, and i firmly believe that but there are certain people who are better at certain things than others there's certain people who are smarter than other people Dan, there are certain people Dan, who are more Dan, high-minded or advanced Dan, no 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 you, you are moving this into a different direction of of a competition kind of better thing no, and all no. all we are saying is give peace a chance no, i'm just kidding um <laughs> all, all we all we are saying is that in looking at, at a relationship when you get to a certain point in life i don't ever and and i agree with nicole that it's not a competition and i'm not looking at people that that i may be better than them at certain things it's a matter of i'm intrigued I'm interested. I want to find commonalities with them, but I appreciate the fact that they have unique characteristics and they're different. And I want to know more about different things. I want to keep learning through the journey. And I think that that has nothing to do with being worse or better. It has to just do with being right. present and yeah. being open to different things. So it's not bullshit. You can't call that. You can't, you can't say that that's bullshit if that's how we both feel. Well, I mean, he can say it's bullshit, but better implies a value judgment. Right. That's yeah, and, and that's the word we're stuck on. And I and I don't mean better. I'm just right. using the word that Scott had used. I'm not. I don't mean better as in a value judgment of someone else. I mean, there there are quantifiable ways to determine. So like, I can't dunk a basketball, right? I'm not as athletic as the guy who you used to date, who flew back and forth. You know what I mean? Like, if you were looking for a more athletic guy, you had him, and it wasn't me. You know, we talked about that a lot. If you're looking for somebody who can match you intellectually, it's probably also that guy and not me. But you know what I'm saying? Like that. You get what I'm getting at. Like there are yeah. different levels that different people have and better, you're right. We're stuck on the word better. And that's not what I mean. It's not a or, value judgment, or, but. Or, like, let's take the comparison words out. And what I'm just looking for is someone who can match me in intelligence, someone who can match me in energy, someone who can match me in life success, confidence. I'm, I'm blessed to have kind of been able to get to where I am in life. And I want somebody who can meet me there. That's all. And it's not in any way a comparison of, better, smarter, like no comparison words, just somebody who's really smart, someone who's really funny. No, I, I appreciate it. And, and I don't want to derail everything. Can I ask a question that, that was asked to me that we can throw to you? Please. And sort please. of a little bit what we talked about before, but in, in terms of comfortability, I know you and I talked last time and you said like, maybe don't have sex with somebody who you're not comfortable with. Maybe get to know them first and see what you each like, and then it'll be a better experience. What happens when you get to a certain point in a relationship 
And that person now feels comfortable to bring up different things that they're into. Like, hey, by the way, I haven't felt comfortable over the six times we've gone out or whatever, but I like to use this toy or I like to have a third person. And, and that changes the dynamic. Because even when that person, and this is, what, this is what was brought up to me, just asking that, are you okay with this? Changes the whole dynamic sexually because that other person now thinks, well, am I not fulfilling enough or do they need something else? And, and, and have you seen that where when someone feels comfortable to now be themselves, it kind of puts a block on, on the other person in a way because now they feel like they're less than. No, not at all. I think, I mean, if, if you're emotionally mature, right? That's just adding something to it. You're getting to know more about someone, getting to know them more deeply. I, I mean, so I think you're right. A lot of people make other people's stuff about them. So if you tell me you're into this or I want to do that, there's no, I'm not going to make that about me. That's not about me at all. It's about what you yeah. want and what you like. Um, but yet yeah, you're, you're correct in stating that a lot of people do make other people's stuff about them. And so they could take that the wrong way. And I have that misrepresenting. Happen. I might be misrepresenting it a little bit. I'm not trying to say like oh, they're they're freaked out. I guess that's not something that act would not be something they are comfortable with. And so they were comfortable with the with the relationship to that point. And now since the other partner becomes comfortable enough to admit like, oh, by the way, I really like doing this, then it, th that's where the disconnect is. Not necessarily like um, they're freaked out by that person. They just wouldn't do that themselves. So I apologize for maybe misrepresenting that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, but that could come with anything, right? I think that's about getting to know someone better and compatibility, because that's what you're doing when you're dating. And it takes, like they, some, some of the experts say it takes like 18 months to really get to the point where those initial chemicals wear off and you're totally in the place of just knowing the person for who they are and not kind of in the fantasy land, rose colored glasses. And so that whole process is about getting to know who is this person and are they compatible? And it makes sense to not go too fast and get committed too fast or too deep too fast because then you kind of get stuck in something you have to extract yourself from when you realize, oh no, they're into this weird thing that I, I can't stand. Right, right. Right. So, I mean, I think the whole dance of dating is about getting to know someone and figuring out whether you're compatible. And that's just are part we of the process. Weird sexual. We, we have I learned of two new sexual kinks actually just yesterday. Please share. There you go. Yeah, Floor's one, yours. Is called, one is called Vore. Have you ever heard of Vore? No. It's wanting to, it's all fantasy. It's wanting to either like eat your partner or be eaten by them. Oh, and the Army Hammer thing. Is this where we learned about this? Is that? No, I learned it actually because I put out a job. Uh, I'm an ad for a new sex therapist. And we got a response from someone who said she's, you know, she's doing sex therapy and is has just started working with fetish population and just fantasy fetishes so ones that are not actually able to be fulfilled such as vor and macrophilia which i had never heard of macrophilia is liking giants so you want to have like a sex with a giant woman or like go inside her vagina or something like a cave i don't know but wow. there i mean if there's a weird thing out there that someone could do there's a whole group of people who want to do it it's amazing and God bless them for it, right? Yeah, exactly. Not, the world would be boring. Yeah, as long as you're not hurting anybody, right? As long as you're not yeah, hurting anybody, then go for it. We could probably talk for the next three hours, um, but we're, <laughs> we, I think at some point we're going to have to cut off. Scott, do you have any one last question for Nicole? Not ever, but just like in this conversation. <laughs> I mean, I think this has been really fascinating. I think the combination, Nicole, of the fact that what you do and that you're out there back again dating is really fascinating to me because I am too. And I, and, I, and I think we have a lot of similarities, you know, in terms of just how I feel about work and, and how that relates to, you know, dating and, and, and different people. Um, I think that I, my, my, my last question, I don't know, this might be a longer question or a longer answer, but I, I am a big believer in being super communicative throughout the whole process. This is who I am, right? And again, Dan and I debate this sometimes that, that you know, maybe I'm too communicative or I'm just curious from you personally and from your experience in terms of what you do, 
is there anything bad with being over communicative? Well, I guess it depends on how you define that. Over communicative, probably, yeah, that's probably not good. There's there is such a thing as TMI, right? Or just right. too much, too much sharing your internal process where it just like you might overwhelm someone. I think yeah, most. Let me let, let me restate that. Right, right. Let, let me restate that because that's damn. Uh, um, so 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 I'm saying like, is there any issue? I shouldn't have said over communicative. Is there is there really an issue with being communicative? Because sometimes. I am communicative. I don't believe I'm over communicative. I think I'm, I'm on par communicative, but some people are not. And, and, and a lot of women aren't comfortable with that because they've been in relationships where there was no communication and, and they just felt like they were pushed to the side and they didn't have any idea what was going on. So I guess maybe on that level is more, let me put it a different way, is on par communication healthy? Um, obviously, right? I think yes. It depends on how you're defining it. Do you mean you have lots of contacts throughout the day? Do you mean you go really deep into different subjects or you ask them very personal questions? I think we need more definition of what you mean by the type of communication you're talking about before we could evaluate if it's healthy or not. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends upon the person, obviously. Like, and I, and I feel like I'm a good read on people. So, I like to be communicative throughout the day. If I'm interested in somebody, like, like I'll I'll be consistent with my communication. I think as I'm getting to know them, I'll ask more questions and go a little bit deeper, not too deep where they feel uncomfortable about it. But I guess that's part of the point where when when and maybe this is too broad. I mean, it's too hard to answer because it's too individualized. But when when is it going too deep? when you are really trying to get to know somebody? Like wh when is it a point where if they're not telling you to stop but all of a sudden they get turned off or they might be like, you know, this guy's asking me too many questions. Why is this guy asking so many questions? Why is he, you know, so interested in the things I've done? And it's harmless. It's, I'm, I'm just asking questions and interested in what they've done because I'm just trying to get to know them better. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you answered your own question, right? If somebody, if the way that you communicate is too much for somebody, they're not the one for you. Right. And so right. see you later, somebody else will come up who loves that, who wants to, who's up for you asking these deep questions or communicating multiple times a day. I think that's the thing that everyone is out there trying to figure out what's the right thing to do or the right way to do it. The best thing you can ever do is be your own full authentic self. Yeah. And then the people who love that are going to stick around and the people who don't will go away and it naturally selects. People are so stuck in image managing and people pleasing and trying to be liked or accepted that they right. end up selling themselves short and abandoning themselves in you know trying to be acceptable to somebody who they're not even going to want to be with i mean I've, I, I, I know i've done that in the past i think we all do that at some point in our lives yeah, yeah for sure i think that's well i think that's right i think that's well said and i think that i've seen that again being out here for so long i think i've seen that in so many different ways and forms. And I think over time, and I think this is for everyone who listens to us too, that there are different stages in this process. I think they need to understand that, that, you know, I still haven't figured it out, you know, and, 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 and again, it's individualized. So it depends upon the person, but I think what you said is really valuable to me and hopefully to other people too, which is you have to be true to yourself. And sometimes when you get involved in this dating you know, a relationship situation, you, you compromise too much, you become too much of a people pleaser, because you just want to want it to work. And I think that gives you a false sense of security of that relationship. And I think if you are true to yourself, then to your point, they'll either love you and appreciate you and, and want to go on the journey with you, or they won't. And then you find the next person who is more, uh, you know, compatible. Do you remember the anxiety attack I was having earlier? It's back because like this is like a countdown clock. So we're going to have to save that for next time. I don't know. I'm freaking out right now. I'm like, shut up. The clock is going to stop. I know. I see it there. <laughs> Nicole, thank you for, thank you for doing this. It's better to talk to you than just him. I really appreciate it. Likewise, better to talk to you, Nicole, than just Dan. So we might have to have you on more often. Yes, I totally enjoy talking to you guys. I thought it was going to be gang up on Scott Day, but it turned out to be gang up on Dan Day. Shocker. <laughs> Scott, do you we want to throw it. your peace sign up before we, have, before we have to go? We love gang up on Dan Days. Yes, Nicole, thank you so much. This is really helpful for relationships. It's helpful for the whole thing we're doing. Helpful oh my God, clock's ticking. Just say thank you and do it. Hopeful, that we have, <laughs> hopeful for the fact that we have kids 
And I always like to say it, kids 